I would ask you to continue to tune in Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. We have a ton of information every Wednesday. We're trying to keep everything to one day a week, and so I would ask you please to tune in every Wednesday and get the word out to your friends. If you can't, uh, please sign up for a daily email at governor.ri.gov. Get an email every day, and also on Saturday, a refresh for the entire week. Before we talk about coronavirus, I just want to take a minute to acknowledge the fact that we had a pretty quick yet serious and disruptive storm yesterday afternoon. Um, I, in fact, I just, um, a bit late today, and I apologize, I've just been out and about surveying some of the damage and talking to folks who have had damage to their homes or their cars. Um, I want to thank Director Mark Pappas for doing a, a good job managing this. He and his team, my team, we've been in touch constantly with National Grid throughout the night and all this morning. Uh, to those of you uh, that are still without power, uh, hang in there. I'm sorry. Uh, that would include my family who are at home without power. Uh, this is a serious storm. It came and went quickly, but knocked out over 150,000 Rhode Islanders from having power. To put that in perspective for you, that's more than uh, Superstorm Sandy some years back. So we went from having 150,000 people without power to right now about 70,000 Rhode Islanders are still without power. Uh, I want you to know we are pushing grid as hard as possible to get everybody back up as quickly as possible. Uh, and they're working hard. They have lots of trucks here. They're well resourced. We expect two thirds of Rhode Islanders will be back online with power by um, this time tomorrow, if not before. So um, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. We are doing everything we know how to do. And if you if you need help, um, call the governor's office, call National Grid. We're all going to do everything we can to get you back up as quickly as possible. Um, at this point, uh, every area with a hospital or a nursing home or critical infrastructure is back online. That's been prioritized. Okay, so now we'll switch over to um, the other disaster that we're managing, which is coronavirus. And we'll begin, as we always do, with the data. And I'd ask you please to put the data on the screen. Yesterday, we had 84 new cases. Um, so that's uh, certainly better than the triple digit days we've been having. Um, 84 new cases, and very sadly, another death. We continue to lose people. We've lost well over 1,000 Rhode Islanders during this pandemic. And so it's a, just, it's a reminder every day to every one of us, let's, let's not get lazy. Let's not get lazy. Let's keep our groups small, wear our masks, because we've, we've lost far too many Rhode Islanders to this crisis, and we have to continue to do better. Um, all right, as many of you have seen, as of yesterday, several of our neighboring states put travel restrictions on citizens of Rhode Island. Uh, so to, I'm sure you've seen this. If you haven't, I'd encourage you to learn more about it if you plan to travel. If you go to Connecticut, New York, or New Jersey for more than 24 hours, they will ask you to quarantine there for 14 days. If you go to Massachusetts, you need to quarantine for 14 days or provide proof of a negative COVID test within 72 hours before you go. These states all have their own rules. You should, if you're planning to go there, you need to check out those rules. There's, this doesn't apply if you're going for work. This does not apply for commuters. It doesn't apply if you're seeking medical care. It doesn't apply if you're an essential worker. Um, but I, I would say this is new news. It's starting uh, today. And if you're planning to go to Connecticut, New York, New Jersey for more than 24 hours, it applies. If you're planning to go to Massachusetts, it applies. Um, and Dr. Alexander Scott is going to focus her time today going through uh, why that's happening and, and the numbers uh, around prevalence there and prevalence here. Here's, how, here's what I think about it. On the one hand, I think it's a good thing. It, it, it should certainly be a wake-up call for the people of Rhode Island uh, that we need to do better. Our numbers are creeping up, there's no doubt about it, 
and we could be doing better with our social distancing and mask wearing. Um, this is also a good thing because the less we're all traveling, uh, the better. And I think these restrictions, they're going to mean fewer people obviously coming to Rhode Island. If you're, you know, from another place, you're, you're not going to want to come to Rhode Island to use our facilities because you'll have to quarantine when you go home. Um, so it's, that is a good thing. You know, it would be fewer people coming to Rhode Island and fewer of us traveling. Staying close to home is still the name of the game while we're fighting the virus. And that is, um, you know, I think will help us fight the virus here in Rhode Island. As I say, on the other hand, this, listen, this means we have to pay attention. I have been up here for weeks asking us to keep our, our group small, putting the social gathering limit from 25 to 15, warning that there would be consequences. Um, there's no way around it. As I've said so many times, you cannot fight the virus. It's not going away. We can't hope to trick it. It's here. If we don't follow the rules, things like this will happen. And uh, this will hurt our economy a bit. You know, for, for folks who are maybe thinking of coming from Massachusetts to one of our fabulous restaurants in Providence, they will think twice now, and that's a shame. And so the rest of us have to get more serious. Um, I will say this. It's not cause for alarm. And we're going to go through the data, and the doctor will go through the data. Our percent positive rate here in Rhode Island is still below 3%. We've still tested more people per capita than anywhere in the country. We still are in good place with our hospitalizations, uh, and we're still below 3% test positive, which is where we've been for weeks. So I'm not here telling you to panic, but I am saying this. We are at a turning point right now. We want to get children back to school. We want to get folks who are out of work back to work. We want to make sure that our hotels and restaurants and such can be operating and people can get back to work. We're teetering right now. We were at a very fragile place. If I had gotten up here today and said we had 115 cases yesterday instead of 84, that's, that would not be a good thing. So we have a choice right now. This is a turning point right now. We need to clamp down ourselves and get more serious. And I'm going to go through a handful of new restrictions that we're putting in place. These are the next step. If we don't start to follow these new rules, then probably next week I'll be back with much more restrictive rules, just, just like you're seeing everywhere else. Can't go to the beach in Florida. Can't go to the water park in Arizona. I don't want to have to do that, but if we don't all start trying harder, that is definitely where we, we will be going very soon. Not because I want to, but because we will have to. And you're seeing it today already. Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey are saying Rhode Island needs to get a, a bit more serious. Um, let me say a few things. I know there are uh, some people who were planning to go away, you know, this weekend or next week. Hey, Governor, I've already rented a house in the Cape for next week. I've already spent a lot of money for a, a hotel in Nantucket. Um, some people were planning to go away to see their family in New York. So uh, we are, as of this afternoon, I want to help you out. I'm sorry that this is inconvenient. So starting this afternoon, we're going to make it easier for you to get a rapid test so that your vacation plans or travel plans for next week won't get uh, disrupted. Beginning this afternoon, you can go to portal.ri.gov and there's a, there'll be a new uh, special place that says planning to travel to another state. If you click on that, you can get yourself tested. You can, we're setting up a site at the convention center. We have a site at the convention center. And we'll work as hard as we can to get you your results within 24 to 48 hours. So if you're listening to me now, you're anxious about plans for next week, this afternoon, go to portal.ri.gov Go to the section that says traveling to another state, sign up quickly, go to the convention center, get yourself tested, and we'll, we'll try hard, and I believe we'll be successful, to get you results within a day or two. Um, for the rest of us, look, 
I've been asked many times at this press conference, can we do more for small businesses? Can we pass out more aid? And the answer is we're trying and we want to do that. The best thing I can do for small businesses is to keep them in business and to get them back in business, which means the best thing that all the rest of us can do is follow the rules. It's getting very frustrating that people who aren't the small percent of folks not following the rules are really going to ruin things for everyone else, for the kids who want to go to school, for folks who want to go to work, for people who want to go visit mom and dad in nursing homes. So I'm asking you to let's go back, let's remember how we all came together in March and April and May. Let's get that spirit back. This is a turning point now, it's on us, and I think if we come together and really restrain ourselves, we should be, we will be just fine. As I say, this isn't an emergency at all. We're low, less than 3% test positive. It's a turning point. And I, I think we have it in us. Have some Rhode Island pride. I do not like seeing us in red on that map. Have some pride in ourselves and our response. And let's, let's make it our business to do the right thing. Uh, we also are going to be ramping up enforcement of our own out-of-state quarantine order. Uh, last week, going through our new cases, more than 11% of our cases traced back to out-of-state travel. So we are obviously have to get a lot more serious about stopping these cases from coming into Rhode Island. I want to take this occasion to remind you, anyone coming to Rhode Island from one of the 33 states around the country with a percent positive rate of greater than 5%, or any Rhode Islander who travels to one of those places must quarantine for 14 days or present a um, valid negative test from within 72 hours. And I'd ask you please to put the list of those states up on the screen. Um, you can see that list on the screen. It's constantly refreshed at the Department of Health's website, constantly refreshed at reopeningri.com. If you're planning any kind of travel, check it out, please. Uh, we're going to have to follow the rules. This, um, I want to be clear, that applies to Rhode Islanders who visit these states for uh, non-work-related purposes. Now, we're also uh, going to get a little bit stricter on enforcement. Beginning this Sunday, anyone from those states on your screen who checks into a hotel or a beach rental property or any kind of a rental property is going to need to sign a certificate of compliance verifying that they have had a negative test result or that they intend to quarantine for 14 days while they are here. If they do not do that, they will not be able to stay in Rhode Island. So um, in other words, if you try to check into a hotel, try to check into a B&B, try to check into your beach house rental and you don't have and you're from one of these 33 states and you don't have proof of a negative test within 72 hours these hotels will have to turn you away uh, we're going to be requiring hotels and rental companies explain the requirement in advance when before folks show up when customers first call or click to make the reservation this approach is very similar to what they're doing in Maine. We've been in touch with the folks in Maine. It's working very well there. They're very strict about it, and I think it shows in their results. So we're going to learn from a successful strategy, and we're going to put that in place here. We're working with the hospitality industry um, and with individual businesses to communicate this new change, which will go into effect Sunday. Um, we're also going to be deploying members of the National Guard uh, and the Department of Health at the airport and at the train station, passing out information to anyone who's traveling here, reminding them of our rules, seeing if they have proof of a negative test, and we're also going to be increasing at the airport and train stations and increasing signage at the airport and train stations. So again, we want to open school, we want to open businesses, we want to stay in the safe place that we are, so we have decided to take this additional step to clamp down on out-of-town visitors. Uh, we want you to come and stay here, but you have to follow the rules. And I want to thank the hospitality industry in advance 
for uh, your cooperation. We've been in touch with many of you. Commerce will be in touch with you over the next few days. We'll do everything we can to make it easier for you, but we are going to require you to enforce this, and if not, there will be penalties. Uh, okay, each, I want to talk for a minute about bars. Uh, I've, I've been up here week after week after week talking about bars. Uh, as we continue to go through the data, we continue to see that bars are a problem. Um, we know that, uh, as I explained, many of our test positives are related to someone coming from another state. The same is true for bars, people congregating at a bar. Uh, you see it clearly in the data. Also, bars are doing okay, not great, at enforcing the rules. Um, this past weekend, our inspectors found 20% of bars were still not separating the bartender from the customer. And that's totally unacceptable. We've been at this for months. The rule is crystal clear. I could understand 1%, 2%, 5%, 20%. %. We have been bending over backwards to keep the bars open. You know, rest parts of restaurants, bars can't operate as bars because I am very sympathetic to the fact that restaurants are barely making it. Having said that, the data is clear, the data is in, we have a problem, and we need to get it under control. So uh, there are many voices uh, saying, shut down all bars, all bar areas. And I won't hesitate for a minute to do that if, in a week from now, we're not seeing more improvements. For now, I'm taking a middle-of-the-road approach. Starting Friday, no bar areas in the state of Rhode Island will be allowed to be open after 11 o'clock at night. Um, no bars allowed to operate past 11 o'clock at night starting this Friday. Restaurants that have a bar can stay open. They can serve drinks with dinner to the table, but the bar area must be closed. We are going to be out in force enforcing this. We are going to very much ramp up our inspection over the weekend and next week. And I unfortunately will have to close bars, the, the operating part of a bar, if we don't get better compliance with congregating. I don't know how else to say it. I have been trying week after week to avoid this and to strike a balance so folks can stay in business. There's just too great of a percent of restaurants and bars that are pushing, pushing, pushing the limits, trying to skirt around the limits. It's pretty clear. You cannot have people congregating in your bar area. It's, I don't know how to make it any clearer. And the fact that you're continuing to do that is making it harder to get kids back to school, it's making Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey say, Rhode Island, you better clamp down a little bit. So starting Friday, 11 o'clock, no bars after 11 o'clock. Uh, and as of tomorrow, on reopening RI, Commerce will have all the details around exactly how we'll enforce it, what will be the penalty, and what your bar area should look like. But it's essentially going to have to be a closed bar area and probably roped off so there can be no congregating. Uh, I've also been talking about social gatherings. We are struggling to keep social gatherings um, under control. So I want to remind everybody that the limit is 15. We went from 25 last week to 15. If you hadn't heard that news, I hope you hear it now. 15 is the social gathering limit. You shouldn't be at a party with 20 people. You shouldn't have a baby shower with 25 people shouldn't have a pool party or a family gathering with dozens of people. Fifteen is the limit. I also want to say it should be the same fifteen people. It shouldn't be fifteen friends on Monday and a different ten friends on Tuesday and a different pool party with six different friends on a Wednesday. We have to go back to where we were in April, May, getting really serious about this. Pull out that contact tracing notebook, dust it off, and let's get back at it. I know it's a pain. I wish there were a different way around it, but it's a, this is a brutal reality. So um, figure out who your 15 people are going to be. I'd ask you please, right now, today, tonight, write down who your 15 people are going to be. It's your family, 
coworkers, a couple of friends, stick to that group, please. Um, and, and use your contact tracing notebook because it's, it, you just want to keep track and make sure that in the course of a given week you're near about 15 people. And please wear your masks. I cannot emphasize it enough. It's such a simple thing. It's hard to believe that such a simple intervention could be so powerful, um, except it is. And it only works if everyone does it. So if you know you're going to be close to someone for a period of time, you know you, you can't be six feet apart, you know you're going to be with someone for a while, please put your mask on. If you're waiting in line for takeout, put your mask on. If you're waiting in line to use a restroom at a, any place, put your mask on. Just please wear your mask. Uh, because we are um, having trouble keeping the social gatherings under control, we are also going to increase enforcement around social gatherings. Uh, we are setting up a new crush COVID unit within the Rhode Island State Police to crack down on social gatherings. Um, so I want to ask you, the people of Rhode Island, to help us out. If you see a social gathering that is too big, more than 15 people, folks don't have their mask on, people are bunched up and close to each other, I would like you to reach out and let us know. A lot of you have said, I don't know where to call, I call this place, I call that place, so I'm going to give you one place to call. We've set up a new unit at the Rhode Island State Police to deal with just this. 764-5554. So this weekend, if you want to do your, you know, civic duty and you see something happening that makes you nervous because there's too many people too close without masks, please call that number and let us know so we can try to deal with it. Uh, we will deal with it. State police um, will work with local law enforcement, will work with DBR, will work with DEM and decide the best way to go about it, who should go out, who should make a visit. Uh, but we are getting very serious about this. Our goal is always educate first. From the beginning, we want to make it easy. If you don't have a mask, you know, we're not fining you for not having a mask. We're giving you a mask. We want to make it easy and de-escalate the situation. Having said that, I want to remind you the fine for violating a social gathering limit is up to $500. Uh, that means if you are at a party, and there's 25 people, all close, no masks, every one of you could be fined $500. So I wouldn't take that risk because it's not the right thing to do, and we are going to start enforcing this. To every mayor in Rhode Island, I'm talking to the mayors later today, um, we need the mayor's help as well. Mayors are on the front lines of this. They're doing a good job. But we're going to be asking the mayors to really increase um, to have physical presence, and we're going to try to help them to do that. Mayors and local uh, community organizations know folks in the community, and so we're going to be working very closely with cities and towns just to inc maybe it's a volunteer effort, just increase physical presence out and about so we can reduce crowds. I also would like to encourage everybody to stay outside. We want to keep our social gatherings small. So 15 is the number, but we also know outdoors is safer than indoors. In general, thank God, the weather is good. So please take advantage of being outside. Work outside if you can. Eat outside if you can. You know, uh, so many restaurants have gotten so creative. I'm so impressed with every one of you by pushing tables outside in every possible creative way. Thank you, thank you, thank you for rolling with it. But to everybody, just be mindful. It's a good opportunity to stay outside. Okay, I want to talk about testing. And in this regard, I have um, some good news. We, in addition to the spikes that we've been seeing recently in Rhode Island associated with large social gathering, the reality is delays in our testing results have also caused us problems. It's hard to do contact tracing if it takes six or seven days to get a test result. And this isn't unique to Rhode Island. It is a, this is a 
fierce uh, fight for resources all around the country. And we're in it. We're in it. I'm in that fight for Rhode Island, but every state is struggling for limited resources to get more testing supply. And the thing is, as states are testing more, commercial labs are overrun. And sometimes it takes as much as a week or more to get your test result, which is totally unacceptable, and we will not rest until we fix that problem. So on that front, I have some good news. Uh, after a couple of weeks of scouring the world for more testing supply and a competitive bidding process, uh, we last week were able to contract with two new labs, AccuReference and Dominion Diagnostics. Dominion is a local company here in Rhode Island, so that's always a win-win when we can help Rhode Islanders and put Rhode Islanders to work. The combination of these two additional labs are going to massively expand our testing capacity and, importantly, guarantee everyone gets a result within 48 hours. Starting next week, AccuReference and Dominion will each run 1,000 Rhode Island tests per day, so 2,000 additional tests per day with a guaranteed turnaround time of 48 hours. By next month, Dominion will increase their capacity to 7,000 tests a day, 48-hour turnaround time. So that will bring us up to uh, 9,000 tests per day. If you, include Accu, if you include AccuReference, Dominion, the State Lab, and a couple of other private labs. Um, I personally called the CEOs last week. I said, you better guarantee this is 48 hours. They have guaranteed it. It's in the contract. This is a big win. So hopefully uh, in a week from now we'll be in better shape on testing and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to ramp for there. Um, this is, I have been talking to many, many teachers, uh, parents, students. Testing within 48 hours is key. It's a key piece of the puzzle if we're going to get kids back to school safely. And so I want you to know uh, I'm increasingly confident we're going to be able to hit that goal. And to all of you who've been patient, waiting six, seven days for your test result, I'm sorry about that. And next, starting next week, it's going to start to get a lot better. It also, I believe, is going to help our um, overall spread because the quicker we know if someone's positive, we get in touch with all their contacts, put everyone into isolation. It will, I think, really help us keep a lid on the virus. Uh, so to that end, I want to keep pushing, testing, testing, testing. Uh, if you feel sick, even a little bit, if you're in a close in contact business uh, and you don't feel sick, please go get tested. We need more folks tested. If you're positive, we need you isolated quickly. Starting today, we're expanding our asymptomatic testing to every Rhode Islander between 18 and 39 years old. So beginning tonight, if you're in that age group, 18 to 39, please go to portal.ri.gov and sign up for a test. It's free. This is a new initiative uh, at Dr. Alexander Scott's urging. We know we're having more troubles with young people. We know they're the ones who are in more parties, more social gatherings, uh, out later at bars. So we're saying we want you to get tested. And also we know not enough people in that age category are getting tested. So please consider doing it. It won't take long. Portal.ri.gov between 18 and 39. Uh, if you're asymptomatic, you don't, we don't, you don't have to feel sick. We just want to know what's going on in that population of young people. Please go get tested it, and it's, it is free. Um, I do want to say this. Just because you get tested and it's negative doesn't mean you can throw caution to the wind. You still have to follow all the other rules, but we want to test many people in this age group so we have a feel for uh, what's going on in that age group. I want to make a plug for you to download and use your Crush COVID app. Uh, we're up to more than 70,000 Rhode Islanders, so thank you to the 70,000 of you who've done it. You can go to the Apple App Store or Google Play. Um, we have a new version. I use it. I, I like it. It's useful. Um, 
It, this one doesn't drain your battery as much, so please use it. This isn't going to be forever. This is for right now. This is super helpful, and I would ask everyone to please do it. Okay, I want to spend the last few minutes um, talking about schools. Last week, I outlined the different metrics and benchmarks that we're tracking as we think about whether it's safe for children to go back to school and under what conditions, full in-person, fully at home, some kind of a hybrid. And I'd ask you to please put that um, slide up on the screen as a reminder to everyone. There are five key areas that we are focused on as we determine the best thing to do for school. Number one is statewide data. We want to make sure as a state we're still in phase three. Another is municipal data. This is going to be different town by town. Testing, and I just gave an update on that. I think we're going to be in a very good place on testing. Supplies, which is PPE, and operational readiness, which is mainly facilities. A lot of school buildings are very old, and they're having to make accommodations to expand the building, and so they're working on facilities. They also have to ensure that they can be cleaned adequately every day. Um, and as I've said, this is very clear. These are, our, these are the five benchmarks so that we know it'll be safe. If we don't meet the hurdles, we won't open. I believe we can, and we're going to push to get there. And I want everyone to feel confident that if we say school's open, it's because we passed the test. Today I want to talk for a minute about the second metric, which is the municipal case incidence rate. Not every community is the same. We know that. So what's safe in one place is not necessarily safe in another place. Case incidence is typically measured as the number of new cases per 100,000 residents. And based on, last week I explained that we've compiled a team of experts to advise us on school opening. And based on the input of that advisory team of health experts and extensive data analysis, consultation with the CDC and other states, we've determined that municipalities must have a weekly case incidence rate of fewer than 100 new cases per 100,000 people in a week in order to fully reopen their schools for in-person learning. So it's 100 cases, 100 new cases a week per 100,000 people in the town in order to fully, you have to be below that, in order to fully reopen schools for in-person learning. So if in the previous week a city or a town had more than one new case for every thousand residents, then they'll need to go with one of their more limited reopening options and not the full in-person return. So if today were August 31st, what would that mean? That would mean that three municipalities could not open full in person. Those would be Central Falls, Pawtucket, and Providence. Based on last week's data, per 100,000 residents, Central Falls had 186 cases, so well above 100. Pawtucket is at 135, and Providence is just above it at 103. So each of these cities would instead move to a partial reopening plan instead of the full in-person. The rest of the state uh, would be cleared for full in-person. All of the reopening plans are posted at backtoschoolri.com. Backtoschoolri.com. So if you're living in Providence and you're wondering what the partial reopening would look like, Go to that website and it'll explain in detail how they're thinking of doing the partial reopening. We're going to make our final announcements the week of August 16th based on the previous week's data. Uh, it is my hope that, it, certainly with the case of Providence, that we would be able to get you back to school, which is why we're up here saying we're enforcing social distancing, we're enforcing social gatherings, we're enforcing out-of-town visitors, we're enforcing mask wearing, we want to, and we're improving our test result time. We want to get, we have a little spike now, 
don't want it to get out of control. We want to turn it the other way while we still can without locking down our economy again. So these are the three cities, and we're all going to be working hard, hoping to get them under 100. The Department of Education is working day in and day out with each city and town to prepare their opening plans. Um, there's been a mix. Some towns have been fantastic. Others have work to do. And I'd encourage you to do that hard work. Um, I want to commend Tiverton, Smithfield, Situate, and Middletown. Um, they've done a fantastic job with their plans, their creativity. I, I'd encourage every Rhode Islander to go online and look at those, Tiverton, Smithfield, Situate, and Middletown. Um, again, it's at Back to School RI. They have excellent plans for full in-person learning in a way that's safe. They include provisions like live streaming from classrooms for students who have to stay home to attend virtually. They have special initiatives that emphasize social and emotional learning as well as academic learning. And they've really leaned into um, surmounting all of the many challenges that are going to exist for schools this year. So thank you to all of you for working hard and a special thank you to you folks who put forward such a fantastic plan. As I've said, and I'll say it again, we're not going to force any parent to send their child to school. It's, a, it's parental choice. Our job is to make it safe for them to go to school. If your child is sick, has an underlying health condition, doesn't feel comfortable to go in person right away, every school will have distance learning options and you will not be forced to go. Uh, but I hope that over the next few weeks, um, we can work with cities and towns so they have robust in-person plans and robust um, distance learning plans so that we are ready for whatever coronavirus throws at us and our children don't suffer, don't continue to suffer. Kids are getting behind. Kids learn best in school. Um, so we're, we, we, we owe it to these kids to make sure we are ready for high quality learning in any scenario. And to those of you who wish we could make these announcements sooner, um, I do too. The reality is things change every day. So right now we're planning. We're working for the best, planning for the worst, and we'll make final decisions August 16th.